Well, hello everyone. I'm recording this in March and in just a couple more weeks, guess what we'll all be doing? We'll be having the solemnly joyful Passover service. I call it solemnly joyful because that's certainly the way I look at, look at it. When Yeshua, our Messiah, our Jesus Christ, put on the last Passover, the last supper, and uh, literally hours before he'd be crucified the very next day. His death was not just for church people. His death was not just for good people. His death were not just for Christians, but for the whole world. As you know, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one and only son, that whosoever believes on him would not perish but have everlasting life. He died for everybody in the whole world, for people in China, for people in Peru, Ecuador, Mexico, Philippines, America, Canada, all over the world. I'm starting this way because we're in the middle of a pandemic. There's an angst all over the world. As people get on Facebook, there's an angst. You know, how bad will this thing get? When will it stop? Will it be so bad or is it overblown? And how many people will die? Already many have died. And so far, I don't know anybody personally who has it. And so I'm very thankful about that. So. Right now, as I speak, it'll be much more than this. Over half a million people worldwide already have it. So hello, everyone. This is Philip Shields. Welcome to our website, Light on the Rock. Because of shelter at home rulings, a lot of you are feeling very separated from loved ones, from friends. I just want to start with this first. From family, from sons, brothers, sisters, parents, children whom you haven't seen. You can't leave your house. Well, turn with me to Romans 8, 37 to 39. I'll read it to you from the complete Jewish Bible. I like the way they put it. Romans 8, 37 to 39. There's one separation that nothing and no, nobody, nothing can affect that particular separation. Let me read it to you. Romans 8, 37 to 39. This is out of the complete Jewish Bible. Knowing all these things, we are super conquerors. Though the one who has through the one who has loved us, for I'm convinced that neither life nor death, or he says neither death nor life, neither angels nor other heavenly rulers, neither what exists now or what is coming. Verse 39: Neither powers above, nor powers below, nor any other created thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God. Isn't that just amazing? nor any other created thing will separate us from the love of God, which comes through us through Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. So in spite of everything, you're connected in your life right now through and by and with Yeshua and with our Father. So he died for every single person in the world who will accept him. I hope you, dear brother or sister, have. So today my question is, are you praying for the world. Are you praying for your country? Now, some of you will react by saying, that's a silly question. Of course I pray for my country. Of course I do. I pray for my country all the time. But some of you don't. I was raised in a group where it was kind of us, the called out ones, the select few versus the world. You know. So are you praying for yourself and your loved ones and maybe those in your church? Or are you praying for everybody, especially in this coronavirus thing? Should you be praying for the world? Should you be? You may think it's all right to pray for unconverted people in the world who don't have God's spirit, who aren't Christians, who aren't obedient to him. Or, but if you aren't praying for them, especially in this crisis, why not? Why not? You might think of some verses in your Bible, some of you who think you know your Bible really well, might be thinking of, in fact, in the Last Supper, right after the Last Supper, Judas had already been possessed by the devil. He'd already left. And in John 17, verse 9, uh, Yeshua, Jesus says, I pray for them, the disciples he had in front of him, the 11 remaining, I do not pray for the world. There you have it, right? I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. John 17, 9. He was praying his high priestly order of Melchizedek prayer. 
And that's what he says at that point. So is that a directive from him that we are, should never pray for the world? Is that a directive? Some believe it is. But in this coronavirus epidemic, which is just the beginning of many, many, many bigger ones coming down to us in the years ahead, you watch. This is a shot across the bow as far as I'm concerned. But he can't, he can't be saying that I'm putting down a rule for all of my followers, my brothers and sisters, that they are never to pray for people of the world because it wasn't that long later, right on the cross, as he was in severe pain, as he was being tortured by some very evil people of the world, of his own tribe, Judah. What does he say in Luke chapter 23, verse 34? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. They, ha they, they don't get it. But forgive them, Father, what they're doing to the Son of God, their maker. It's terrible. But forgive them. Is that not praying for the world, for people of the world? I think so. You might think of some verses in Jeremiah. Jeremiah is told three times by God, don't pray for them, the nation. And so again, is that a, a directive now for all of us, for all time? Jeremiah eleven 14, I'll read a few. Jeremiah eleven fourteen. 14. So do not pray for this people or lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry out to me because of their trouble. Do not pray for them. Jeremiah 14, verses 11, to, and we'll talk about this, verses 11 and 12. Then Jehovah, the Lord, said to me, do not pray for this people, for their good, when they fast, I won't hear their cry. When they offer burnt offerings, I won't accept them. I'm going to consume them, he said. Don't be praying for them. I'm going to consume them by the sword and famine and pestilence. The fact that Jeremiah had to be told more than once might give you a hint that maybe he couldn't help but pray for them. Certainly the book of Lamentations seems to be, in a way, a cry. Oh, man, oh man, this is horrible what's going on. And a cry out to God, isn't it? But God was so upset with Judah by the time of Jeremiah's day that he makes another statement in Jeremiah 15, verse 1. He was so upset. He said, you know what? I'm so upset with these people that even if Moses and, and Samuel were here today, Jeremiah 15, 1, I wouldn't hear them. I wouldn't hear Moses and Samuel. My mind would not be favorable towards this people, even if Moses and Samuel stood before me. Cast them out of my sight. Let them go forth. So it's interesting. God's really upset with Judah at this time. And, uh, and, and so he says, uh, whether Moses or Samuel prayed for them. Samuel, uh, you know, you might know the story of Samuel when, when uh, Israel had asked for a king. God told Samuel, they haven't rejected you, Samuel, as a judge and ruler. They've rejected me, God, that I should rule over them. I think that's in 1 Samuel 8. Around verse 6 or 7, I don't have it here, but it's some, something like that. Uh, and so later on, they picked, they picked the king. And when they're getting ready to crown him and all that, in 1 Samuel 12, verses 19 to 23, I'll just go ahead and put it up here behind me, and, um, or, or on the board, that you can be reading as I talk about it. You know, the people knew they weren't doing the right thing. They knew that this was not pleasing to God. Um, and so they come to Samuel and say, oh, please don't forget us. Please continue to work with us. Please continue to pray for us. And all the people said to Samuel, verse 19, uh, pray for your servants to Jehovah your God that we may not die, for we have added to all of our sins the evil of asking a king for us, just like the nations around them. And Samuel says, don't worry about that. Don't fear, but do stay close to God. But notice what he says at verse 23. Go down to verse 23. Moreover, as for me... Far be it from me that I should sin against Jehovah in ceasing to pray for you. Far be it from me that I would sin by not praying for you. Now, I want you to see that, but I will teach you the good and the right way. So Samuel made a habit of praying for the people of Israel and Judah. And so surely you know that Moses also had famously intervened at the gold calf incident. God says, I'm going to blot them all out and I'll start over with you, Moses. Moses basically said, 
don't put me in the book of life. If, if you're going to blot them all out, he's basically saying to God, I don't want to be around forever. If that's the way you're going to be. I, I, I'm putting that in my, my own words, but he says, please don't. And he, please beg God, please don't wipe them out. Please have your mercy. Look, you're, you're a wonderful, merciful God being. Show everybody that's what you are. He also prayed for Aaron. God wouldn't kill him for the gold calf. You know that story. I think that's around Exodus 33, that particular story where he prayed for them. And then in number 16, you might know the story of Korah's rebellion. And Korah wanted to be just like Aaron. And they were kind of cousins or Korah and, 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 and uh, you know, related. They were of the tribe of, of uh, Levi. And in Korah's rebellion, 250 of the leaders that Korah kind of organized had censers in their hand. They were going to show that they too could be priests. And God basically just burned them alive. Uh, you can read the story for yourself in number 16. And then God said to, okay, move away from them. And there was this great big hole that opened up, sinkhole of huge capacity that just gobbled up all the families of those people associated with Korah. And so they were dead. All right. And so what happened? We'll pick it up in number 16, verses 41. Now the next day, number 16, 41, all the congregation. This is a huge rebellion. We all think of Moses as being dearly loved, and he wasn't. He really wasn't. He had to fight their rebellious attitude so many times. All the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron and said, You have killed the people of Jehovah, of the Lord. And now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses, they turned towards the tabernacle of meeting, and suddenly the cloud covered it, and the glory of Jehovah appeared. You would think they have a clue at this point. And then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting, and Jehovah says to Moses, verse 44 now, Get away from this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. That's an order from God. Moses, Aaron, get out of here. Move! But there's something I want you to pick up. God, there's a verse in Ezekiel 22 I meant to put here. I think it's Ezekiel 22, where God says, I've looked for a man who can build a wall and stand in the gap before me to defend the nation, tell me why I'm wrong, to wipe them out. And I found none. So anyway, he tells Moses and Aaron, get away. And they fell on their faces. They didn't move. They, got away. they fell on their faces. Mm -hmm. And then Moses said to Aaron, verse 46 now, Take a censer, Aaron. Go put fire in it from the altar. Put incense on it. Take it quickly. Hurry to the congregation and make atonement for them. Make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. You can see people dying. God said, get away, move, get away from them. And Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly, completely opposite from what God had said. And yet God, I really believe, is so moved. When we cry out, when we beg him to be merciful to the nation, to the moms and the dads, to the husbands and the wives of the one who has the virus, who's infected with it. And I don't mean just in our country. If you're a mom or a dad over in China who started this whole thing, or in whatever place, Italy, Spain, France, Germany, England, it's all over the world. It's apparently over 150 countries right now. I think God is moved when his children say, God in heaven, I know you prophesied end time pestilences. I know you have. But you're a God of mercy, of loving kindness, tender mercies. Please stop. Please stop. I want to bring this in context also of Yeshua and his wife, the bride. And I said, we as husbands, 
we don't own our wives in that sense. We, we aren't their masters that have every right just to order them around all the time. That's not how Yeshua handles me as part of his body, his bride. But in fact, a good husband and wife, so many times a husband will be doing something and the wife will say, what are you doing? This is what Moses is doing right here. Aaron, go into the plague with the censer, which is the petition, which is the prayers. I think God was moved by that when his bride, the called out ones, sometime will even step up to him and challenge him, as Moses did on the gold calf incident, as they're doing right here. Verse 48, and he stood, Aaron now, and he stood between the dead and the living. He got right to that line where people were dying. So the plague was stopped. It doesn't say, so Aaron died with him too because he disobeyed God. So the plague was stopped. Now, the, a lot of people don't notice this story. A lot of people know about Moses praying for, about the gold calf incident, but not this story. Now, those who died were 14,700, plus all those who died in the Korah incident. But anyway, so Moses interceded, God heard. Samuel would, was interceding. By Jeremiah's day, the wickedness was so great, God said, even if they were around, I would not listen to them. So did this mean no prophet of God ever, no people of God ever should pray for the country or the world ever again? This could not have been the meaning because we're going to see so many, many cases where even Jesus, Yeshua himself on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Even though in John 17, verse 9, he had said, I do not pray for the world. I pray for these, my disciples. I do not pray for the world. Now turn to Ezekiel 9. I have... Uh, we'll post this up here while I'm talking about it. This is not to be a doctrinal exercise so much as a, an appeal to your heart to feel for people, even of the world, and people outside the church, outside your fellowship, that you ache in your heart. If you've ever seen any of the videos of those who are dying literally from this COVID-19, it, it's a horrible death. And people who die, for that matter, from AIDS or from so many diseases, pancreatic cancer, uh, it, it, painful, horrible deaths. Praying for the nation, praying for distressed people all over the world, praying for your unconverted neighbors. I've asked God to put a shield around the whole community where I live and even the country itself. Praying we can be better lights than we've ever been before. Do we love the people of the world enough the co the, not the cosmos, uh, not the society, but the people that we can cry out. Now in Ezekiel 9, here's another case where God is angry with the people. It's a prophecy, and the glory of God of Israel had gone up from the cherub, where it had been, Ezekiel 9, verses 3 to 7, to the threshold of the temple, and called to the man clothed with linen, who had the ring, uh, writer's inkhorn on his side. Jehovah said, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. Would you, my question for you is, would you and would I have been among those that would have a mark on our forehead from God as being one of those who cried and sighed over all the abominations going on in the land and uh, presumably we're praying a thy kingdom come kind of message kind of a prayer, we're praying God be merciful, kind of a prayer. Would we have had a mark on our foreheads at that time? But notice verse 6. We'll continue reading here, verse 5. Verse 5. To the others, he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your heart, your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay all the old, the young men, maidens, little children, women, all of them. But do not even come near anyone on whom is the mark, the mark of protection. They're protected. Because they, what? Because they sighed and cried, verse 4, at the end of verse 4, over the abominations that are done within the land. 
And he says, and begin at my sanctuary. Begin with my people. We are the sanctuary of God today. We are the temple of God today. And so anyway, um, and then also when you think about Daniel, Daniel 9, go back and read it. Daniel's prayer of repentance for the nation and asking God's mercy on the nation. Daniel didn't just pray for them. His prayer was a we are sinners. We have done wickedly. We have done badly. Forgive all of us. He included himself, and yet Daniel, and there's a verse in the Bible that puts Job and Daniel, and was it Noah, I think, the three so-called most righteous men who ever lived, Job, I think it's Noah and, and Daniel. Um, but Daniel, I think, is one of them. Now, he's praying for people in his country who are wicked, and he's including himself, that we are, have done wickedly. Please have mercy on, on all of us. I've known ministers of God, at least ministers, <laughs> who would not pray for healing if you weren't part of their church or if you were in a, an ongoing kind of a bad situation that didn't get approval from him. I had a man one time who was an alcoholic and he was in the hospital and he was dying of cirrhosis of the liver. And it was early in the morning, I got a phone call from a woman who was his mother, an old widow. And she said, she told me the story, I've asked for prayers for my son and so-and-so won't anoint him. I know it's early in the morning, but would you pray for my son. And I said, I surely would. Where's the hospital? What's the, what hospital is he in? What room is he in? She said, I'd like to be there. So at 2 a.m. I drove by, picked her up. We went to the hospital. We prayed with him and for him and we're, sat there with him. Was he a sinner? Yeah, he was a drunk. Was I a sinner? Yeah, I had sins too, some awful sins. Was his mom ever a sinner? Yeah, we all have been. And I want to ask you of all the people that Yeshua prayed for and healed, name me one who had God's Holy Spirit. John the Baptist, but he died soon in the ministry. All of those who were healed were simply asking for healing. And even for that matter, as we come to Passover, when I see the blood, I will pass over those houses. Exodus 12. When I see the blood, he doesn't say when I see that you finally have overcome all your sins and you're finally doing everything right and you aren't having bad marriages and you're keeping the Sabbath. When I see the blood. Now, some of you won't pray or aren't praying for people of the world because God's prophecies, you think, are so ironclad that there is no way, anyway, they're, 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 they're cut in stone, they're set in stone. And so there's no point in praying for God to be merciful because God said, we're going to have earthquakes, we're going to have wars and pestilences and famines and stars falling from heaven. I mean, the, the you know, meteorite showers and asteroid falls and so on. No, no point. There's no point because the book of Revelation has been written. The book of Daniel has been written. Matthew 24 has been written. Remember that God says in Ezekiel 33, verse 11, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel 33, 11. I don't take any pleasure from seeing people die. But I, he said, what I take pleasure in, read it up here behind me, but is that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? I mean, God isn't saying, now that you've crossed the, the certain line, that's it, I'm going to wipe you all out. First, he sends his prophets and they beg them to turn and repent. Why do we think, why do you think we have the story of Jonah and the story of the city of Nineveh, which is now in the area of what, the city of Mosul, Mosul, Iraq? Is where Nineveh used to be. You know the story. If you don't, go read it. It's a short three or four chapter uh, book, I believe. 
and uh, about four or five chapters maybe. But anyway, I think it's a very short book. And uh, God had told Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh and, and tell them that if that they were going to be destroyed because they were so wicked. Um, Jonah tried to run the other way. And God made a special fish that swallowed him up, cast him on the shore. Eventually Jonah gets there. And uh, Jonah 3, verses 4 to 10. And Jonah went, began to enter the city, a huge city, on the first day's walk. And then he cried out, said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth. And from the greatest to the least, word came to the king, it says, and he caused it to be proclaimed, verse 7 and publish that no one is to eat or drink, not even the animals. Don't let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let's all, verse 8, cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way, which we know delights God. I just read that to you. Ezekiel 33. Turn from his evil way and from the violence that's in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent, turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Now verse 10, then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster he had said, that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. But some of you feel Nineveh and the story of Jonah is a one-off. That that's not going to happen again. It can't happen again. Some of you are so certain that the nation of Israel, what we'd call Judah, over there in the Middle East, America, Britain, and Canada, and Australia, and so on, we're all going to go into big punishment for all of our sins. It's going to get worse and worse. It's going to be absolutely horrible. And I believe it will be. Don't misunderstand me. All of those prophecies will happen. But do they have to happen? According to the story of Nineveh and some other verses I'm going to read you, God is willing to turn and change what he even wrote or said would happen. Do you believe in God's love and mercy so much that if enough of us would pray that maybe some of the horrible things that are prophesied to happen just may not happen? 2 Chronicles 7, verses 13 to 17. I'll read part of it at least. You know, our own President Trump, a couple weeks ago, I think it was March 15, declared a national day of prayer. It didn't get a lot of press, but it did happen. A national day of prayer, a day of seeking after God. As I said to my wife today, all, uh, all these task force meetings and TV uh, meetings that they have before us. I wish they would still, even still, talk about let's all pray to God in heaven. But they don't. They're afraid of separation of church and state or whatever they're afraid of. But he did ask for a day of prayer. He didn't ask for the nation to turn from its wicked ways, as far as I know, but it's a historic good start. Vice President Pence did say, start spending more time on your knees and less time on the internet. So now let's read 2 Chronicles 7, verse 13. When I shut up heaven, and there's no rain, where I, com I, God, I command the locusts to devour the land. Over there in eastern Africa, in northeastern Africa, there have been billions and billions and billions of locusts. Billions. You can Google it. See pictures and videos yourself. eating everything in their path. I prayed for those people. I don't know those people. But what a horrible thing to have to face the sky dark from the numbers of them. Or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, are you a people of God? If my people who are called by my name, Church of God, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face 
and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. So even if my people, in this case he's talking about Israel, today we are the Israel of God according to Galatians 6. Whether you're Chinese or Filipino, or whether you're Kenyan or Somali, if you have God's Holy Spirit, you are Israel of God. Some of you Jews don't like that, but that's what it says in Galatians 6. I think it's Galatians 6. I need to put some all these verses down anyway. But now my, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. Where's the sanctuary? Where's the sanctuary? What is the temple today? Isn't it us, the people of God? For now I've chosen and sanctified this house. Who's the house? We're the house of God. That my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Today, you child of Holy Father in heaven, are the house of prayer. Today, you are the house he speaks of, that he'll be attentive to your prayer. So you better be using it. You better be known as the house of prayer. And turn from your own wicked ways, it says. Notice it says, notice it was for wicked people who turn from their wicked ways. I gave a sermon just before this one about are you ready? Are you prepared for Passover? Part of the big point I was making there was get rid of the final 11 that you're protecting in your life, secret or ones you're just not quite ready to get rid of. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. You can read a couple other stories where God was very merciful. He had decreed a certain prophecy. King Ahab, God said in, second, in 1 Kings 21, verses 20 to 29, if you want to read about it, if you're not familiar with it, God had said, okay, Ahab, Elijah went to him, and his evil wife Jezebel had, had seen him moping around, seen Ahab moping around because he really coveted uh, a vineyard. Uh, that someone else owned, and his wife said, don't worry about it, I'll get it for you. So she had, him all, he, she had him framed, basically, and killed. And God's so upset by this that he tells Elijah to tell him he's going to die because of that, and his wife's going to be eaten by dogs and everything else. You can read the story in 1 Kings 21, 20 to 29. But we find that Ahab went about humbly, and put on sackcloth and got very humble and was mourning. God saw his heart that he had become, for him, very humble. And God actually reversed it even for someone as evil as Ahab. There's a verse in the Bible that says, even the prayers of the wicked are an abomination to God. And yet here's an example where God heard and reversed himself when Ahab prayed and mourned. God's prophets, prophecies are not all set in stone. There's another one, King Hezekiah, a righteous king. And God had told him to get his uh, things in order because he was going to die. He was going to die and not live. <laughs> and that's in 2 Kings 20, verses 1 to 6, if you want to read the story. 2 Kings 20, verses 1 to 6. But then Hezekiah laid in his bed, and he cried out to God, wept before God, cried out for his mercy, and God heard it, so much so that Isaiah, who had just given him the prophecy, was told before he got outside of the court's yard, Isaiah, get back in there and tell him, I've added 15, I've heard his prayer, and I've added 15 years to his life, and I'm going to get rid of the menace of the Assyrians. I'll protect him from the Assyrians as well. Well, his son, Manasseh, was one of the most wicked kings, that ever ruled over Judah. And the story continues in 2 Chronicles 33, verses 9 to 13, that Manasseh seduced, King Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations God had kicked out. And so it goes on to say in verse 10 and 11, and verse 10, Jehovah spoke to Manasseh and his people, by the prophets, I'm sure, but they would not listen. Therefore Jehovah brought upon him the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, whom God had spared from his father, 
who took Manasseh with hooks, verse 11, who took Manasseh with hooks. They stuck hooks in him, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. Now Manasseh might have been remembering. I, I remember something about my dad praying, and God, he told me how God added years to his life. So perhaps Manasseh remembered that. And um, in Second, where are we now? Second Chronicles 33, verse 12. Now when he was in affliction, he implored Jehovah his God and humbled himself before. Now God obviously had prophesied and warned him, you're going to get punished for this. But he implored his God, humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and prayed to him, and he, Jehovah, received his entreaty, heard his supplication, brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew Jehovah was God. Because you see, God had said, I'm, I'm giving you these scriptures and these stories, why? Why? So that you don't feel that all these prophecies, I gave a sermon on this right after Katrina with these same verses years and years ago, when Hurricane Katrina came in. We got to be aware that God, when he makes these prophecies, he's such a tender, loving, wonderful being that when we will pray for the nation, he's moved by that. God wants to see people pray. You know, Abraham, when God said, Abraham, I'm going to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah and the other three cities around it. I'm going to wipe them out. We don't find, we infer from what Abraham is saying that he's talking about Lot. If there be 40 or 30 and 20 or 10 righteous, will you spare the city? He doesn't, he doesn't say, okay, God, you can wipe them out. I don't like them either. Uh, just save my nephew, Lot, and his family. He doesn't say that. He says, if there be 10 righteous, will you save the whole, spare the whole city? That's in Genesis 18. Genesis 18, when Abraham prayed for, in talking to God directly, prayed for God's mercy on, of all places, Sodom. And even Yeshua says to the self-righteous Capernaum people of his day, the, the people of Sodom will have a better day of judgment than you will. Because they would have repented had they seen the things we're doing here and heard the preaching I do and all that, you, you won't. So Jeremiah 18, let's look at some other principles here about how God, when he makes a prophecy out there, it's not set in stone most of the time. Jeremiah 18, verses 7 and 8. God speaking here, The instant I speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, to destroy it, Jeremiah 18, verse 8, If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. To me, that is no different than what happened at Nineveh. Jeremiah 18, verse 9 now, And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight, so it does not obey my voice. I will relent from the good I said I would do for them. That I'd prophesied. I'm going to relent from that good. So a lot of it depends on our reaction to God and his way. Verse 11. Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Jehovah, Behold, I'm, fa I'm fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Let that sink in. And look what he says. And this is spoken right to you as well. Return now everyone from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. What he had just said earlier was if you turn from the evil in verse 8, I will relent of the disaster I thought to bring upon it. What I'm saying is don't think God's prophecies are so set in stone that there's no point in us praying for the nation or the world. Don't go there. I'll give you a couple more. Ezekiel 26, verses 12 and 13. Jeremiah spoke to all the princes of the people, saying, Jehovah sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city with all the words that you have heard. Now, therefore, and this is probably the part that Jonah didn't exactly preach well 
uh, that if you repent, I have a merciful God I serve. He, Jonah wanted them wiped out because he knew the prophecies that it would be Assyria that would come and destroy and enslave the Israelites some years after that. Probably that's what was going on. Now, Jeremiah 26, verse 13, Now therefore amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of Jehovah your God. And then the Lord, Jehovah, will relent concerning the doom. He, then he'll relent. He says, I'm supposed to tell you all this horrible stuff coming. But if you will turn and amend your ways, seek him, God will relent from concerning the doom that he had pronounced against you. This is the verse I was telling you about earlier. I thought, I, I thought I'd forgotten to put it in, but let's read it. Ezekiel 22, verses 28 to 31. Remember, God's not pleased with the death of anyone, the death of the wicked, even sinner. He's, he's just not. He wants his people. That's you, brethren. That's you who are listening to me right now. Standing in the gap. Interceding for people. Interceding for the nation. Look how sad this passage sounds. Ezekiel 22. Verses 28 to 31. Her prophets plastered them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions, dividing lies for them. Saying, thus says the Lord God, and here's Adonai, Yehovah. When Yehovah had not spoken, they're claiming to speak for God. Uh, the Lord spoke to me last night and said this. The Lord said this. The Lord said that. Be careful. Don't be making that up. Don't be making that up. The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, mistreated the poor and the needy, and wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So God said, I'm, pretty, I'm getting pretty upset the way things are going on down in, my, down in the land. And so I sought for a man among them, verse 30, who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, on behalf of the land facing up to me that I should not destroy. Give me a reason not to destroy it. I want someone to stand up like Moses did, like Abraham did, like Samuel did. The complete Jewish Bible says, I look for a man to oppose me, to stand in the gap and oppose me on behalf of the land. Therefore, I poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them. Why? Will this be God prophesying that in the last days there won't be enough people of God who are called by my name, who are asking him to be merciful, and who are turning from their own wicked ways so God would spare his land like we read in 2 Chronicles 7? Or are, are there no people standing in the gap willing to defend this nation before God? A contemporary English version says, I looked for someone to defend the city and to protect it from my anger as well as to stop me from destroying it, but I found no one. Remember what I said earlier where a good wife will at times say to her husband, yes, her husband is the head of the wife. But a good wife will sometimes say, honey, what are you doing? Maybe wake him up what he's doing. God says, I want my people sometimes to say that to me, to God. What are you doing? Won't you have mercy on the land? That's a bold prayer. I want my people having a heart for the people of the land. God saying enough to even stand before me on the behalf of the people, on behalf of them. I'll be impressed with that. He's implying here. So let's pray for the nation, for the world. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. As we pray, thy kingdom come. Paul says in Romans 10, verse 1, look at Paul's example. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God. He's saying to the Gentile Romans. Now, there were Jews in Rome as well, but it was largely a Gentile church. That, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. It's your prayer to God for America, for England, for Australia, for Canada, for France and Germany, for the whole world for that matter. It's your prayer to God 
B, that, Father, may your prophecies not happen. May you turn your mind, change your mind. Save these people. Bring them to salvation. Bring them to their knees to seek you. Again, I say we need to be calling our congressmen and senators and saying, why aren't we asking the, the nation to pray? To pray. Is your prayer to God that America be saved, that England be saved, that Canada be saved, that Kenya be saved, China be saved? You Chinese out there better be praying for your country. It sure needs it. We Americans need to pray for America. It sure needs it. And if we're not, why is Paul doing it and somehow we think we don't need to? Shame on us. You read Romans 9, verses 1 to 5, and there you'll see that Paul even said, I'd give up my very salvation. He implies if it would mean that God would be able to save all of Israel. Romans 9, verse 3, I could wish myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. Are you there? Am I there? If we're not, God have mercy on us. Because we're supposed to follow Christ. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When did you and I last pray for our country? When did you last pray for England and Kenya? Would you give up your salvation, as Paul implies? If in return God would say, I'm going to save all 350 million Americans. Paul implies he'd be willing to take that. And don't say you'd be willing to do that if you're not already and not willing to pray for your nation, for your neighbors, for sinners. So what about God and Jeremiah? It could not have been a command for God's people for all time. Because like I said, Daniel, after that, prayed for Judah, prayed for God's mercy. Do you know that Jeremiah even actually tells the people, when you go into captivity to Babylon, let's read it, Jeremiah 29, verses 4 to 8. Do you think there'd ever be a time that the Bible says you were to pray for Babylon? I know what Revelation 18, 4 says, Come out of her, my people, that you may not be partakers of her plagues and her sins. Come out of her. And yet Jeremiah himself tells the people of Judah, when you go into captivity, and you're going into captivity, Jeremiah 29, verses 4 to 8, Thus says Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I've caused to be carried away from the Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses. It'll get a little easier over time in there. Dwell in them. Plant gardens. Eat the fruit. Take wives. Beget sons and daughters. Don't give up on life. Keep living. Get a positive attitude about things. He says, take your wives, your sons, and give your wives to husbands, so they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek, look at this, Jeremiah 29, verse 7. And seek the peace of the city where I've caused you to be carried away captive. He's talking about Babylon. Pray for the peace of the city where I've sent you, he says. And pray to Jehovah for it, for in its peace you will have peace. Are you letting that sink in? You're still wondering if you should pray for the nation, for the world? You're part of the people God calls my people. Let's read it again, 2 Chronicles 7, 13. When I shut up heaven, there's no rain. And I command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence like COVID-19 among my people. If my people called by my name will humble themselves. That implies fasting. If you will fast, seek my face, pray to me, seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. 
then I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin. And I will heal their land. You want to see a miracle? You want to see whole prophecies maybe not have to happen? Then a lot of us who are my people of God need to do what it says. Remember all those verses I gave you in Jeremiah. When I say doom, but if those people will repent, I will change my mind and I won't do it. I want you to tell people about this sermon, this website, this message. I want you to ask people to pray, to fast for this nation, for the country, wherever you are around the world. About 70 nations come to this website. You need to be telling your people, if we will seek our God and fast and pray for our nation, this COVID-19 will disappear. And God will heal our land. I hope you will do it. This has been very helpful, I hope, to you. And I thank you for coming to our free website. Pray for my friends over in Kenya. There's a whole orphanage there full of kids whose parents died. We don't want them getting this COVID-19. I don't want you getting it. So pray for one another and pass good news on to each other. Celebrate those who are defending the sick. Celebrate the first line defense people who are going in, who are doctors and nurses and CNAs and EMTs and everybody else, ambulance drivers and whatnot. Pray for them. God blesses them, protects them. I've got a cousin and two nieces who are caregivers for the sick, nurses, CNAs, and so on. Bless them. Bless them. I hope you found this helpful. Please tell others about us and our site in the sermon. Until next time, we're going to pray for God's blessing, dismissal. Be sure that you love your Father, you love your Savior, and one another. Let's ask God's dismissal. Loving God in heaven, our Father and our Savior, oh Abba, dear Daddy, we love you so much. Help us love you more. We know you loved us so much. You gave your eternal companion and your only Son, your only begotten Word of God, who became flesh, for all of us who, Yeshua, you died for all of us, but you died for me. And you died for each one of us. Personally did. Just like Paul said, who lived and who died for me. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, we feel that. And now we bring our nations to you. We ask you, in your mercy, break the back of this COVID-19. We ask you in your kindness to help people understand they need to seek you. That's really what we pray for, that you use this as a shot across the bow to get their attention, to get our attention, and that we will come to you and just beg you to help us turn from our wicked ways to help us seek you with our whole heart. Be with the first line caregivers, the nurses and doctors, and firemen and police officers, all these people. Put your guardian angels in your merciful protection over each one. Bless this people again. Let them know there's a God in heaven. Let them know there are enough people, your people, praying, praying, crying out to you that you've heard this and you've healed their land. We thank you so very much, dear loving God. Shine your face on us again. Lift us up. Shine upon us. Bless us. Protect us. 
certainly keep this virus away from your people, but not just your people. I'm praying for the whole world. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.